In 2014, I was driving at night on Highway 81 in southwestern Oklahoma. It was around 2 a.m., and I hadn't seen another car for at least 30 minutes. I was on a stretch of road between Chickasha and Rush Springs. In other words, I was in the middle of nowhere. I come over a small rise and see a car upside down in the ditch and a body laying just out of the car. It kind of looked like he was sleeping on his side. I slam on the brakes and get out of the car and run over to the guy. I touch his shoulder and he kind of slumped over onto his back. It was then I could see his head was smashed flat on the left side and his abdomen was open. I could smell whiskey coming out of his gut. It was horrifying. This man had no pulse, so I get my phone out and call 911. I give them an estimate of where I am. They tell me the nearest help is 25 minutes away, and I needed to wait with the wreck until they got there. Well, fuck. I hang up the phone and look around. I'm alone in the middle of nowhere in Oklahoma, the only companion to a dead man. Not knowing what to really do, I took his hand and said the Lord's Prayer, and covered his face with a shirt that was hanging out of the car. I seriously was shaking a bit. It was then I heard the coyotes start turning up. If you haven't heard this sound, it's akin to small children being hurt badly. They wail and screech, in what I think is a big circle around me and this man. It's been 15 minutes and no other cars have shown up. I hear them on the highway. They are crossing just out of the headlights of my car. Now, I have a decision. Do I get in my car and let them come up and tear on this guy? Or do I find something to swing and protect his body? I chose the latter. I got the tire iron out of my trunk and go back over to where his body is. I guess I'm making a stand. I wait another five minutes. I hear them running around. It's really dark. I realize I'm not truly in control of this situation. Something very primal comes over my brain. It's akin to rage, along with a heavy dose of fear. Whatever was going to happen, I was going to fight like a crazed ape on the savannah. At this very moment, I see car lights. Finally, a car shows up. And wouldn't you know, it's a Pontiac Grand Am full of methed up country boys. They pull to the side and look me over, then see the dead man, then the car. I say, guys, that guy is dead and there are coyotes circling me. They go to their car and pull out several handguns and a couple of flashlights. They are wired for sound and excited as fuck to kill the shit out of these things. Although... They were almost as unnerving as the wild animals out in the dark. A couple of minutes pass and we hear a siren off in the distance. The guys say, it's the cops. They jump in their car and haul ass. I'm alone again. Me and this poor man. Sixty seconds later, a state trooper shows up. Then two deputy sheriffs and finally three city cops from some small town called Ninica. And finally, an ambulance. They looked the guy over and pronounced him dead. Then they asked me at least a hundred questions, and finally asking if they could search my car for drugs. They search and find nothing. Then they tell me, Thanks for staying with the wreck. You can go. I left, and start driving down this pitch-dark road yet again. I feel like I've been in a battle for my life and thinking our civilized behavior is little more than a thin veneer over a wild animal that wants to survive. This encounter would have happened a little over 10 years ago, but I cannot 100% remember what year this was now, but it was sometime from 2011 to 2013. I am a male, and I would have been about 26 to 27. At the time, I was frequently going out with my friends to bars and parties, and hanging out until pretty late most weekends. The friend's house that I usually hung out at was on a side street, 
just off of a main road where a lot of popular and crowded bars and restaurants were. He had a park on the street at his house, and during the weekend when it was busy, it was pretty common to have to park a number of blocks away. The street closer to the bars was pretty nice, but if you went a few blocks in the opposite direction, it got a little sketchier at night. After a night of hanging out, I had to walk back to my car pretty late which was parked a number of blocks away towards the slightly sketchier area. This was during the winter, so I was wearing some kind of heavy sweater or pullover and a beanie or knit hat. This detail is only important, as you couldn't really gather much idea about what I looked like from a distance in the dark, aside from my general height and build. There wasn't much through traffic as you got further away from the bars, and the roads were pretty dark without any street lights. As I was walking down the sidewalk, a car started slowly creeping down the street, matching my pace as it pulled up beside me, and then stopped. The window of the car rolled down, and driving the car was an attractive young woman who said that I looked cold and that I should let her give me a ride to where I was going. She seemed very friendly. I indicated that I wasn't parked very far away and appreciated the offer, but I was just going to keep walking. She then tried really hard to convince me to get in her car with her, since it was so cold. There was no small talk to establish any information about me to make sure I wasn't a weirdo, just asking me to get in the car pretty aggressively. Based on what I was wearing and how dark it was, there was no way she really could have had much idea about what I actually looked like to possibly find me attractive. And even if she did... I don't know many women who would pick up a male stranger after midnight when they're alone in their car. There were about ten bars nearby she could have gone to if she just wanted to pick up a guy. There was no reason that I could think of that she would have to resort to driving around, offering to pick up strangers. She continued to drive alongside me and offered me a ride again, which I declined and kept going. I picked up my pace and she eventually drove off. As soon as she was a few blocks away, I quickly got to my car and made sure there was nobody lurking around or close by. The whole scenario felt off, and it didn't make much sense to me. I asked my friend about it later, and all of the women agreed. They wouldn't offer a random guy a ride at night time in that kind of scenario, even if the guy looked like Ryan Gosling or Channing Tatum. My suspicion is that there was someone laid down in the back seat of the car, out of view with a weapon, waiting to rob anyone who accepted the ride. I couldn't really figure out any reason she would be offering rides like that to complete strangers in the middle of the night, as it would be very unsafe for her just to pick up random strangers. I just assumed there had to be something nefarious going on in that car, and I do wonder what would have happened if anyone just hopped in the car with her. When I was probably 13, my family and I were on our way home from a Wednesday night church service. My mom was in the driver's seat, and I was behind her in the back. My five-year-old brother was in the middle, and my ten-year-old sister on his other side. We were just down the road from the church, but it was a country road and late, so there was no light and no one else on the road. We were just coming up to our turn when all of a sudden a car comes swerving from our turning spot. This little car was taking the turn so fast that they came into our lane and almost hit us. We swerved as they tried to get into their own lane before we collided. Unfortunately for them, they overcorrected and their car flipped and landed on the driver's side door in the ditch. My mom, of course, hits the brakes and immediately jumps out of the car to go help whoever was in there. She got about three steps away from our car and stopped dead in her tracks. My sister and I are sitting there with our mouths hanging wide open, having no clue what to do. All I could think was, this isn't actually happening to us. This kind of stuff only happens in the movies. But why isn't my mom going to help the other person? It was summer, so we had all of our windows halfway down. I heard a person start yelling help from the inside and my mom starting to move again to help him. 
but for some reason, she stops again in the center of the road. Another car flies up behind us, and the guy doesn't hesitate to jump out and run up to the crash to help. The man gets to the car and starts prying the passenger door open so the guy inside can get out. I can see my mom wants to run and help, but it's like she can't move from that spot. The good Samaritan that pulled up behind us is able to get the door popped open. The guy from inside crawls out the door and gets into a frog-like crouching position on top of the car. At this point, my mom starts taking shuffle steps back to the car. When I look back at the guy, he has this crazy look on his face. He looks directly at our car and my mom and launches himself off the top of the car and hits the guy who was helping him. He starts running for our car at the same time my mom turns around and runs for our car. He must have known he couldn't get there before my mom did because he changed directions and moves to the car behind us. My mom jumps in and locks our doors, just as the guy jumps in the empty driver's seat of the car behind us. He slams on the gas before he even closed the door and almost hits us taking off a second time. Next thing we know, the guy who was just carjacked runs up to my mom's window and starts screaming and knocking on the window. My mom is of course shaken and doesn't want to roll down the window, so she settles for cracking it so we can understand what he's saying. He's yelling, asking us to call 911 because his phone was in the car, along with his girlfriend. So of course my mom starts searching for a phone to call, but because she's so frantic from what just happened, she can't seem to find it. So I take a break from keeping my little brother and sister calm, and I dial 911 on my phone and hand it to her. While she's explaining what happened to the 911 operator, we hear a woman scream down the road. The man that was at our window takes off running and a few minutes later comes back with a severely scraped up woman in his arms that turned out to be his girlfriend. My mom unlocks the door at this point and he sets her in the passenger seat while we waited for the cops. The girlfriend told us that he noticed her while he was speeding off and he tried to hit her but she scratched and punched at him and while trying to plead with him to stop the car. He kept coming at her and finally rolled down the window and pushed her out going about 60. The cops finally showed up and talked to all of us to get our stories. While talking to one officer, he told my mom that the man had shot and killed a man behind some apartment complex. That's why he was driving so fast and trying to get away. When we finally got home, we were all told to go to bed, but of course I wouldn't be able to sleep that night so I went downstairs to talk to my mom. I worked up the courage to ask her why she stopped running to the car when the other guy didn't. She told me that she had such a strong feeling that she should stay in the car with us that it was almost like she could hear it. When she heard him start yelling for help, she ran to help again, but just like the last time, she got the overwhelming feeling not to go to the car. To this day, I wonder what would have happened if my mom hadn't listened to that feeling. The man could have easily overpowered her and got into the car if she'd been any further away. I should also mention that the man was caught that night trying to steal a new car. He had already ditched the car he stole from behind us, so the thing that really helped him get convicted was when the woman was fighting him off. She grabbed the wrap off of his head before falling out. She didn't know she did until the police got there and found it by where she was pushed. He did go to jail, but I was never informed of how long or anything else. And honestly, I never cared to ask. Back when I was still working at a rehab facility, as a social worker for girls who were victims of sexual assault. It was out of town. I would take a jeepney and a bus as well to get to my workplace. I was an in-house social worker, meaning that I will stay at the facility for five days and I can get two days off. My shift is Saturday to Wednesday, meaning that I can go back home Wednesday evening and return to the rehab facility Friday evening. I like to travel during evenings since there are not a lot of passengers and I can enjoy my window seat alone. 
The facility is located in a rural area. I can take a tricycle going down there from the bus stop, but it's too expensive for me. I would always walk alone, and mind you, I have to pass through a white sugarcane field before going there. There's no consistent street lights there, but I didn't mind it, except for that one night. Just near the road was a small mom and pop store where I usually would buy my snacks. It's about a kilometer away from my workplace. I got close with the owner, and she would often say that she'd ask her son-in-law to drive me to my workplace. I always politely declined her offer because I don't want to be a burden on anyone. That time, she offered again and I took it, because when I looked down the road going to my workplace, it was dark. The air felt heavy and weird. I finished my Pepsi and cigarette and hopped on the back of the motorcycle. When we reached the middle part, there were five to seven drunk men talking in the middle of the road, and they saw us coming. One of the men said, Miss, come down and talk to us. I got scared and he walked closer. The woman's son-in-law instantly accelerated his motorcycle as fast as he could, and some of the men chased us while calling after me. Thank God they were not able to keep up. If I didn't trust my instincts, I don't know what would have happened to me that night. My family and I are from Australia, and back in 2007, we decided to take a month-long holiday to America. We traveled from LA up the west coast, and then back down through Nevada. We did this by renting a car and doing the whole vacation, road trip style. One night, we were traveling towards Lompoc, and stopped in Santa Barbara for the night to sleep. We drove around while looking for a decently priced motel that wasn't too... Bring your own UV light, if you know what I mean. My mom and dad found a place that looked okay, and they went inside to inquire about the price of a room for the night, while my sister and I stayed in the car and listened to music on our iPods. We were bopping along to the Frey album I'd bought that day, when my sister removed her headphones and said, Look at mom, what is she doing? I look up out the window and can see into the reception of the motel, and I see my dad talking to the manager and my mom displaying very cold and odd body language. She's usually very friendly with staff everywhere, so this was odd for her. What's wrong with her? I said to my sister as we kept a close eye on them. My mom was standing behind my dad with her arms crossed and looking around the place as if she was on guard for something, as if her hypervigilant senses had kicked in. After some time, my mom and dad get back in the car and discuss what to do about staying the night. My dad stated we wouldn't find anywhere cheaper for the night, and he was hungry and ready for dinner, so we better just stay here. Plus, it was the last room available, so we would have to make a quick decision. To his dismay, my mom disagreed. I don't like this place. I have a bad feeling, said my mom. My dad argued on getting more and more irritated that my mom couldn't explain what she didn't like about the place, until my mom finally snaps and yells over my dad, saying, We are not staying here. Fucking hell. Fine. My dad says as he starts the car and backs out of the motel driveway. At this point, my sister and I are looking at each other, like, What just happened? but we stay quiet as mom seems on edge. Anyway, we end up finding a place to stay that mom approved of and bunkered down for the night. In the morning, we're all bustling around the motel room getting ready for the day when my dad turns up the TV to hear a new story about a shooting at the motel my mom didn't want to stay at. It turns out that about 15 minutes after we left, a couple walked in and booked the last room and the man that was behind them shot them because they took the last room. We all turn to look at my mom, who's standing there wide-eyed, watching in horror. I told you I had a bad feeling about that place, she said to my dad, who was pretending not to listen. The moral of the story is, always trust your gut.
or better, your mom's gut. I had this experience years ago that I always think of and wonder how differently things could have gone. So, I was around 17 to 18. I'd gone with a friend to a pub that wasn't so bothered with checking IDs, so we had quite a few drinks. We left when the pub closed and I walked my friend home. I was supposed to be staying at my sister's house to babysit for her the next day. I'd missed the last bus, so I decided to walk. This was a four-hour walk that I'd done plenty of times before during the day, and it didn't even occur to me that a girl wandering around on her own in the middle of the night was a dumb move. So, I'm walking, and most of the route is through residential areas, some petrol stations and closed shops, that kind of thing. Around three hours or so into this walk, there's a 30-minute or so gap between one housing estate and the next, which is just country lane with fields either side. I know this country lane is coming up, and as I'm getting closer and the alcohol has worn off, I'm starting to think I'd made a stupid decision. The roads had been pretty quiet, and by now, it was probably around 3.30 a.m. A white car drove past me, heading towards the country lane, but I didn't really think much of it. About a minute later, the same car drives back in the opposite direction, slowing down as it passed me. All of the windows were tinted, so I couldn't see who was inside. The car turned around further back and passed me again, heading back into the country lane area. And I thought, oh shit. I was coming to the end of the housing estate and closer to the country lane, so I darted off to my right into the housing estate and waited out of sight for what felt like forever. But looking back, it probably wasn't very long. I heard a car pass by a few times, and then all went quiet. I thought it was probably safe to continue now. I came out of the housing estate, looked about, and couldn't see anyone around, so I continued my journey. About five minutes or so into the quiet lane, the same white car drove past me from behind, and parked up a little way ahead in a lay-by on my side of the road. I slowed my pace and started to panic. I didn't want to turn around because then the car would be behind me, and that thought scared me even more. I couldn't cross over because there was no footpath on the other side of the road, so I'm just slowing my walking towards this white car, getting more and more scared. Just then, a taxi pulled up next to me, and the driver wound down his window and asked if I wanted a lift home. I was already panicking and almost screamed at him that I don't get into cars with strangers. He said he had a daughter about my age, and he wouldn't want her out at this time. I looked at the taxi, looked at the white car, and just ran and jumped into the taxi. As we drove off, I looked back and saw the white car speed off in the other direction. The taxi driver dropped me off at my sister's house. I always think back and think firstly, how can I be so stupid? Secondly, what would have happened if that taxi driver hadn't stopped? This takes place back when I used to live in southern Indiana. It was a weekend night, and my best friend and I were coming home after our graveyard shift at a local waffle joint. She decided to get her dog from her house so we could stay at my place for the night. So we start heading out into the country where I live, and to get to my house, there's a long narrow dirt road you have to go down. About a mile or so in, we see a truck's headlights. We get closer, and it's a nice truck, probably like a 2018 at least. He's parked to where he's sideways, blocking the whole path. Confused, I get out and ask if he's okay. He looked hopeful when he saw me at first. I'm just waiting on a friend to come get me. My truck stuck. He smiled at me, and I noticed his pupils were nearly completely dilated. He looks back to my car and sees that I have someone with me, and he looks at the dog, sticking his head out of the window. His smile fades. He says, 
pit bulls are mean and nasty. He quickly turns around and gets back in his truck. I go back to my friend and I'm like, put this shit in reverse and use whatever hood race skills you have to get us out of here. So we take my poor 95 caddy that really shouldn't be driving on a dirt road anyway and back all the way up down that road and get back to the main road. Relieved, we take a different road home. Then, lo and behold, the same guy is parked on that road, standing off to the side, smiling, just looking into our headlights. We were completely about to shit ourselves, and we gunned it the rest of the way home. I don't know how he got there before us, or what his intentions were, but I'm thankful I wasn't alone, being my naive college girl self. Back when I was 18 to 19 years old, I was house-sitting with a girl I was studying with. The family we were house-sitting for went to the same church as her, but I didn't really know them well myself. It was more to keep her company in a huge house. This was 1997, when the average teen like me didn't have a cell phone. During the week that we were house-sitting, it was a short break in the school calendar, which is why this family was away and why the streets in the area were quieter than usual. My apartment as well as the house we sat for was not far from the university. My apartment was actually a three minute walk from it, and the house a further five minutes by car. So being a student neighborhood, it was particularly quiet this week. The first weird thing that happened the week I was at this house was that I dreamed I was driving through a dark forest on a windy, hilly dirt road, with no lights anywhere except for those from my car's headlights. As I started to go down a hill, the headlights suddenly cut out and everything went dark. The car slowed down to a stop and died. I woke up. In the morning, I went out to my car and it wouldn't start. It had been working perfectly the day before. I had to call a guy to come fix it. It was the starter motor. Well, that was the first creepy thing that happened that week. A day or two later, it was Friday, I planned on driving back home to my parents, who lived in a smaller town about 45 minutes away. I packed up my stuff at the big house and was going to head over to my apartment to collect whatever else I needed for the weekend. The trip between the house and the apartment was, as I mentioned, only five or so minutes away. Since it was winter, it was dark by the time I left at around 7pm. As I was driving from the house, I noticed in my rearview mirror the headlights of a car behind me, tailing me really close. When I turned, it turned. Back then I was cautious, but not overly so. Cautious enough to notice in such a short distance that something weird was going on behind me. But then when I pulled up to a traffic light, it wasn't there anymore. Relief. Short-lived though. The car was now beside me. I looked to my right, and there was a man inside, alone, smiling at me, slightly maniacally. I also thought, well, he's in the lane to turn right, so I'm all good. I pulled off, and the headlights were behind me again, so close I could barely see them over the back of my car. What an ass, I thought. Who drives like that? Thank goodness my turn is coming up on the left soon. After another minute or two of this tailgating, I slowed down, strategically didn't indicate, and made a sudden sharp left into my driveway, opened the automatic gates and shot inside. The gates closed behind me. Yay, the drama was over. I gathered a few things from the car to take up with me, and noticed on my way over to the stairwell that there was a man at the gate that had just closed behind me. He was still on the other side, and I was at the far end of the parking lot, but I could make out it was the guy from the tailgating car. He was jumping up and down, shaking the gate with absolute rage. Well, I was safely on this side, so I wasn't completely gripped with fear. And besides, there was a group of students making a noise nearby arriving for a party or something. I headed to the stairs and started going from the basement slash ground level to the first floor. 
Rounding the stairs on the first floor, I noticed someone running across the parking lot towards the staircase. In hindsight, I still can't fathom why I didn't put two and two together. I guess it's because I subconsciously knew that there was a group being led in through the pedestrian gate. As I was rounding the staircase between the second and third floors, someone suddenly touched me. I spun around. It was the guy. He'd slipped in as part of the small crowd. He said something. I said something sassy back and told him to fuck off. Then I turned my back on him to continue up the stairs. I lived on the third and last floor. He grabbed me from behind, held my back against his chest, with his left arm around my neck. I felt something being held against my right side. Shit. A knife. He led me down. I remember thinking that the light was broken on the bottom level. This can't end well. But I was calm. I resisted slightly. He tightened his grip. I felt like I wasn't getting enough oxygen. I started to become a dead weight. He started to drop me. I was groin level. I elbowed. It connected. He dropped me but spun around to face me. He ripped the front of my button down top. Then he stopped. He looked at someone behind me, someone taller than him. His eyes went wide. He turned and ran. I screamed. Then I too turned around to see who'd come to help. There was no one there. But people came out of their apartments after that. The police were called. This was the second time they were there that night. I didn't know. It turns out that the other weird thing that happened was that my dad had already called the police and they'd come past an hour before. My mom had a weird feeling all evening and hassled my dad endlessly that something bad was going to happen to me. She had been right. As it turned out, they caught the guy. I identified him in a lineup. He had 14 accounts on sexual assault on women. One had thrown herself out of the first floor of her apartment to get away from him and she'd broken her leg. Weeks later, the police called me. Before his trial, his cell door had been left open. He was gone. Apparently, it was an inside job. To preface this, I love to drive. Like hours-long drives to nowhere with no destination in mind. Just me, my music, and the road ahead of me. Living in Nebraska, I'd often take back roads or lonely highways cutting through the countryside to small towns and eventual cities. And I'd usually take these drives at night since there was less traffic to worry about. I've done it since I've had my license four to five years ago, and I've never once had any sort of issue nor have I ever run into any trouble. That was until a few nights ago. For reference, I'm a relatively small 22-year-old female, and as I've stated before, I often take these drives completely and utterly alone. They're a good way to clear my head when I'm stressed, upset, or overwhelmed, or for me to get a plan together to sort out personal issues. I've also done these long and lonely drives to get away from the toxicity of my household when I used to live with my parents as a mean of coping with their alcoholism. Though now that I've moved out and in a much better place mentally, I don't really have the urge to get in my car and just drive anymore. However, on the night this event took place, I was feeling pretty overwhelmed, stressed, and anxious with a clusterfuck of personal issues that I'd rather not get into. I felt restless and irritable around my boyfriend. I couldn't focus on anything else. I decided I would take a drive to clear my head. My boyfriend was understanding and told me to be careful and not to be gone for too long since it was getting pretty late. I agreed, gave him a kiss goodbye, and left. I drove around our city for about 30 minutes, but I was still feeling on edge about everything transpiring in my personal life. So I decided to drive further north, down those familiar, dark, winding one-lane highways. I kept the car at a steady 65 miles per hour, 
taking the turns at a slower pace in case a deer jumped out around the bend, and I was just admiring the vast empty darkness of the snow-capped fields and barren trees. It was honestly a bit creepy being all alone with no cars in sight, in seemingly the middle of nowhere. The few houses miles back from the road lightless, and the dead cornfields withered away and covered in the snow. It was like something out of a horror movie, and I half expected to see a ghost pop up in my rearview mirror, or see someone clamber out from the patches of trees dotting the horizon. The only light came from my headlights, and even then, I still strained to see through the inky darkness of the night. By now, it was just after eleven, and I told myself that once I made the familiar roundabout that would either take you to a small town or back up towards the city, I would head back to the city and home. That roundabout was still maybe 15 to 25 minutes away, but other than my imagination picturing the worst, I wasn't really all that concerned. I mean, I was by myself. I didn't have any other motorists to worry about, right? Wrong. As I'm rounding another bend, I notice a vehicle with its hazards flashing, maybe a quarter of a mile or something away from me. It was some sort of a sedan, dark colored, and was angled to where only part of it was on the shoulder, while the rest was jutted out onto the road, kind of like they had to pull over in a hurry, but didn't quite manage to do it. The driver's side door was flung open, and as I slowed my vehicle down and angled it toward the opposite side of the road to pass, I could make out what looked like maybe blood on the inside of the open door. I didn't see anyone on the road or in the car, and I was the only motorist in sight. The cell phone reception is spotty at best in this part of the country, but more often than not, you couldn't get reception no matter how hard you prayed, which was definitely the case when I took a glance at my phone to see if I had any service. So, a lone female on the road, at night, pulling up near a vacant vehicle that looks like someone had been attacked on the inside with no cell service. Now, I'm no dummy. I've watched countless episodes of Investigation Discovery and Criminal Minds and read far too many true crime books to know that this had bad and danger written all over it, but there was still a part of me that worried something terrible had happened to whoever was in that vehicle and I thought I needed to help. These roads don't get a lot of traffic late at night, and temperatures were well below freezing. If someone were hurt or in trouble, there was no one and nothing else to help them but me. Still, I erred on the side of caution. I was still driving my car, though a bit more slowly, and as I approached the vehicle, I rolled down my passenger window a bit, shut off the music, and called out. Hey, anyone there? Are you okay? I didn't hear a response. I worried they were passed out somewhere, but I wasn't about to get out and look for them. I told myself I'd call out one last time, and if I didn't hear anything, I would leave, and the moment there was reception, I'd call it in. And if I did hear someone, well, I figured out my next course of action then. So... Again I shout, Hey, what happened? Are you okay? There was silence for a beat, and then I heard rustling in the shadow of the trees, followed by a gruff voice saying, Yeah. I was relieved at first, and was about to say something in response, or possibly even stop my car and get out, when I noticed three things nearly simultaneously. As I inched my way past the front of the sedan, I noticed there was no damage to the hood or anywhere else on the vehicle, which I found to be strange considering the blood on the inside of the door. In my rearview mirror, I caught a glance of someone coming out from behind the sedan, and they were making their way towards my car, fast. The person did not have any blood on them or appeared injured in any way. They were wearing a mask, not like the face mask for the pandemic or a ski mask or anything normal but one of those masks you would see in the Purge movies, and they were holding something in their hand. I don't know what it was. I couldn't get a good look, but from its length and shape, 
My guess was maybe a tire iron or a crowbar or something. I don't need to tell you that I slammed on the gas the moment I noticed those things and drove like a bat out of hell. My heart thundering in my chest and my entire body shaking. My window was still rolled down in my haste and the music was still shut off so I could very clearly hear someone, definitely a man, shouting at me. Though I had no clue what they were saying, I just knew I had to get out of there immediately. I stole one last look in my rearview mirror as I drove away, mostly to see if they were getting in their sedan to follow and chase me, or if they'd stopped. The man with the weapon was still standing in the middle of the road, watching me. And right before I looked away from the mirror, I saw a second man emerge from the trees that had been rustling earlier, also wearing one of those creepy masks, and no trace of blood on him. I probably broke every law for speeding that night, but I wanted to get as far away from those men as possible. As soon as I made it to the roundabout, I turned towards town, parked in the Walmart parking lot that thankfully still had cars from who I assumed were workers closing up shop, and proceeded to have a full-on meltdown. When I could pull myself together, I called one of my friends, T, who was a police officer, to tell him what happened and what I should do. He was concerned for me, and after asking if I was okay, where I was, did they follow me, and stuff like that, he told me since it was out of city limits, he couldn't do much on his end, but he could get in contact with the local police and sheriff in that jurisdiction to take my statement and check it out. I agreed, thanked him, and while I waited for the police to show up, I called my boyfriend. Through the hysterical sobs and panic, I managed to tell him what happened not even ten or so minutes ago. He was, as you can imagine, really freaked out for my safety and wanted me to either come home immediately or drive down himself to take me home. I told him the police were on their way to take my statement, so I couldn't leave, and that I was okay. But I stayed on the phone with them until I saw the familiar police cruisers pulling into the lot. I gave the police my statement, and they assured me they would go back to the spot I told them the sedan had been to take a look and that they would try to catch the guys who did it. Though, with no cameras, and no description of the men, I wasn't sure they'd be able to. I didn't even get the license plate, though at the time of my panic, the thought never came to mind until the police were asking if I got it. All they had to go off of was a dark-colored sedan and two guys with masks. After I gave my statement, I went home and stayed curled up close to my boyfriend the whole night, listening to every sound the house made in fear it would be those guys arriving any minute to finish whatever it was they started. Since the incident, I haven't heard back from the police about whether or not they have any leads, and I'm not sure they ever will. I'm just thankful I'm still here, and that I didn't stop my car or get out. I'm not sure what would have become of me if I had. I still have so many questions that have no answers. What were they doing? Why? Was that blood on the inside of the car? or just a ruse to get more attention. If it was really blood, did they hurt someone else? What would have happened to me if I'd stopped my car? Needless to say, I won't be going on any more late night drives to anywhere, and I hope I never cross paths with those freaks again. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed that. If you have a scary story of your own to share and you would like me to feature it on the channel, please send it to the email in the description. Or if you prefer, head over to my subreddit, r slash stories from Mr. Revenant. It's the stories that keep the channel going. Thank you all for listening, and thank you to my channel members and patrons. Joy, Pegasus Genesis, Karen Keating, V. Berry, LJ, Fiona X Fox, Scott, I Like Booty, Monica Level Ace, Chris and Donna, Holly Spry, Kimber, Jasmine, Sanatix, Heather Haven, Q, 
Kitty Cat Luna 2, ADHD Aurora, Janice, Cinderella Baby, Borderline Betty, Lady Dracard, Erica Nicole, Snowball Rathena, Melanie, The Honeybee 987, Pretty Girl 215, Ryan, Brooke, Wendy, Crafty Kel, Tina, Dina, Vampy Debs, Patricia, Amber, Krista, Brenda, Absinthe Alice, Christy, Kay, Spider's Web, Ooh La La Andrea, Sue, Monique, Sean Gorman, Emma Lisa, Sigma Cube X, Greg, Chelsea, Amanda Jane, Sam, Zep Tepe, Sarah C, Austin, Tegan, Lil Smart, Jenny, Gabrielle, Fire 05, Sarah P, James Gargano, Gemma Allen, and Alex. I hope you're all doing well, guys. I'll see you all on the next one.